Good morning and welcome to Arise and Shine. I wanted to speak today a little bit more about the scripture uh, regarding Mary when the angel Gabriel came to her to foretell the birth of the Savior. Um, I've had a bit of challenge in recording this video and um, hopefully it will go off well now. I think it's my third time. But anyways, the Lord be with me. I wanted to open in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your love for all of us this day. And we ask, Lord God, that you will touch each of our hearts. Um, speak to us, Lord God, in your own special way. Draw us closer to you, that there'll be less of us and more of you, Lord God. We thank you for your blessing and your goodness and your grace and your mercy. And we just give you ourselves and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in scripture, um, I wanted to go back and uh, we'll start with uh, the Passion Bible again, which I had uh, mentioned a few weeks ago, was it's a nice translation uh, to give you a, a little different uh, view of things compared to the King James or the NIV or any other version. So I've been enjoying this Bible as well. In comparison, I read all of them, but um, this is this one just seemed to touch my heart in what I wanted to speak on or what God had showed me to speak on today. So I'm going to speak in uh, about Luke and chapter one, and um, when. Zachariah, who was uh, served as a priest in the temple, and his wife Elizabeth, who was also from a family of priests, they were both lovers of God and living virtuously, following the commandments of the Lord fully. But they were childless since Elizabeth was barren, and now they were both old. One day, while Zachariah's priestly order was on duty, he was serving as a priest, as the priest, and a large crowd of worshippers had gathered to pray outside the temple at the hour when the incense was being offered. All at once, an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, uh, standing just to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was startled and overwhelmed with fear, but the angel reassured him, saying, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God is showing grace to you. For I have come to tell you that your prayer for a child has been answered. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you are to name him John. Zechariah was shocked, of course, seeing the angel, but his response to the angel in verse 18 is one that I wanted to put in contrast to Mary's response to the angel uh, in the, in the, farther in the chapter. Zechariah asked the angel, how do you expect me to believe this? I am an old man, and my wife is too old to give me a child. What sign can you give me that this will happen? Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand beside God himself. He has sent me to announce to you this good news. But now, since you did not believe my words, you will be stricken silent and unable to speak until the day my words have been fulfilled. At their appointed time, and a child is born to you. That will be your sign. Wow. And from that day forward, in the if you read the rest of the chapter, Zechariah was stricken with silence until um, the, until John the Baptist was born. So when we flip over a little farther into Luke 1 and um, verse 37, it says in there, um, not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary's response is one that touches my heart so much. And Mary responded when Gabriel came and announced that she would be the mother of the Savior of the world. And she, her response was, this is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass. And the angel left her. Wow, what a stark contrast with one of amazement and excitement versus one of doubt and unbelief. So I wanted to talk a little bit about those uh, today. I found this little teaching and I wanted to touch on that just a little bit. And it, it kind of explains it uh, in a little bit of a different light. Mary receiving her commission from God in Luke 1, 26 to 56. Um, it really brings into um, a sharp relief 
really brings in a sharp relief of Mary's faith and obedience in the face of scorn and shame. Mary's story with Gabriel's announcement. Mary is naturally curious as she seems familiar with the biological realities of childbearing. She's a virgin, how can this happen? When Gabriel explains that this miracle will take place by the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary responds, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. In the Middle East, a person's place in their community is their primary source of identity. This is very different from our culture, in which our identities reside um, in you know, ourselves more so, and people will ask to get to know us by our first name and what we do for a living. But in the Middle East, uh, a woman such as Mary is known by her oldest son's name and her placement within her entire extended family before you would ever learn her name. This is the idea of public reputation. Sometimes a person who brings shame is even killed in order to restore a group's honor. During Mary's time, at least some Jewish understandings of the law regarding adultery reflected this world, review, world view. Mary will soon be explaining to her entire clan and the man she's supposed to marry that this child she carries is the product of the Holy Spirit. Mary, a poor young girl from a small village, will be the mother of the Messiah. It's almost certain no one will believe her. If she is not stoned to death, she could be cast out of her community, divorced from Joseph, and scorned by all who knew her. Mary's response to Gabriel is one of the most exciting ones to me in the scripture, and it shows a life bent towards faith and obedience in God. With humility and little fanfare, Mary accepts both both the honor God gives her as well as the shame that will come upon her. This is no small surrender because she could face death. Apart from her family, she could be cast out and have no home and no income and no identity. There was a lot at risk. On the other hand, Zachariah was an older man and an honorable priest serving in the most honorable place in the planet, the temple. This gave him an elevated status and honor in the community. After Gabriel announces the impending birth of John, Zachariah's response is not one of faith and curiosity, but one of doubt and questioning. In contrast, Mary is a young girl of no status in a country village in Lower Galilee, yet she receives God word, God's word to her in complete trust. She then later in the chapter goes on and it says that she is rejoicing in the Lord and glorified the Lord. And though she is humble, she would be called blessed for all generations. Few of us would think we are like Mary. We have not been asked to abandon our reputations, our livelihood, our entire identities in order to follow the Lord. Or have we? Mary yielded her life completely to the work of God, no matter the cost, and all generations would truly call her blessed. Well, wow, sometimes I contemplate on that. What would my response be? Would it be a response like Zachariah or would it be a response like Mary? I'm sure it is truly shocking to be encountered by an angel. That would be the first thing. But then to respond in, you know, the different circumstances of what the Lord was bringing. I, I, I ask that you consider that thought as well. So I wanted to touch today on a book called Hope in the Dark. And that is Believing God is Good When Life is Not. I purchased this book a couple of years ago, um, and it's written by an author named Craig Groeschel. I have been blessed to attend something called the Global Leadership Summit for many years, and that was introduced to me by my Christian manager in my workplace. And we would go each year, and it's a, it's a worldwide ministry that helps leaders to become better leaders, better Christ-like leaders, and to um, 
to bring more hope and more uh, talents and more Christ-likeness into the world. This ministry is um, held or broadcast in about 150 countries of the world now, helping people um, there in those countries, some of them third world, to become better leaders and more Christ-like and helping um, those countries to uh, become more prosperous and uh, filled more with the word of the Lord. It's an awesome ministry that you could look up online and uh, maybe take part in some of the former talks. I've been totally blessed with that. But anyways, Craig Groeschel, who wrote this book, and he's written several books, is the senior pastor of Life Church, And he is also the champion of the Global Leadership Summit or I would say the head coach. Uh, the Global Leadership Summit is comprised of many speakers that they um, they call to invite to speak and bring uh, messages of hope and encouragement and leadership. And I've been blessed and mentored by them. I just wanted to touch a few things uh, in the book that Craig wrote and, you know, likening it to the Mary and Zachariah story. Sometimes, um, Craig says, I'd even say that every time we feel pain, our enemy will try to leverage that to slip a barrier between us and God. Wow, have you ever had the enemy come and try to raise up a barrier when you're in a time of darkness and pain? Now, maybe in Mary and in Zachariah's story, there wasn't pain at the time. There might have been some darkness. Um, because of the unknown or the fear, maybe, um, in going forth and receiving what God's plan was. But Craig in his book said, but faith isn't about logic. Faith is not a math problem or a language problem or even a philosophy problem. It's a matter of heart. Now, I know that Mary and Zachariah both accepted the Lord's plan, but with very different um, you know, firsthand exceptions of that. In Craig's book, it also says pain in the moment and hope for the future, but sometimes the pain seems to yell while hope only whispers. And sometimes it all leads you to doubt whether God sees your pain and responds or if he even cares. Now we know from God's word that he cares. I know from my life that God cares very much. So I encourage you with this chapter or this uh, word in Craig's book as well. If you are struggling, I'm hoping you are willing to wrestle. So many people seem to be seeking a bumper sticker God with whom life is clean and easy and problem free and answers are clever, even punchy. But life is never clean. It is far from easy. And it's never problem free. That's why I believe putting God into an empty or an easy to explain box is not only unwise, but dangerous. To really know God, you have to wrestle through pain, struggle with honest doubts, and even live with unanswered questions. That really spoke to my heart. There's another, another piece farther on here that I just wanted to sum it up with. And I, I might use that later. And uh, it just speaks to that. But I hope you're blessed. I, I purchased this book because I had given my first copy away to someone who was struggling with a great amount of darkness in their life. And uh, it was uh, a great trial and I gave it to them to encourage. I purchased this at the um, court, the um, cre creation bookstore. Haven't gone there for so long. I couldn't remember the name because of COVID. But anyways, creation bookstore and they had the copy. You could also order it online. But I, it's a really good read and a strengthening in a time of darkness. <clears throat> Trusting God when we can't, when you can't trust others. Knowing God hears you when others don't and finding light even when it's dark is a little caption that Craig has on the back of the book. So I'm going to circle back to that faith-tested scripture in a little bit. I just wanted to uh, resonate and contrast, you know, those two stories of Zachariah and Mary. And what a difference in their accepting. And I pray and I, and I ask the Lord as well that each one of us would receive God's plans and purposes and callings for our lives 
um, and his will in a positive and exciting and amazing way, rather than with questions and unbelief and curiosity and doubt. Now, the Lord <clears throat> doesn't, you know, come down with a big, you know, slap on us when we have questions for him or when we're curious about him. God's love is everlasting and never ending. And there's nothing that you can do that will ever cause God, cause God to stop loving you. So he wants us to come before his throne with those questions and with that boldness. And sometimes, you know, with that, with that pain as well, to help us uh, move forward in his plans and his purposes. I had found a few things um, which I wanted to share. And I know last week in my talk, I had mentioned that I wanted to uh, make a vision board. Um, when I was talking to my daughter, um, she was saying, oh, mom, that's really awesome. And I had learned about a vision board when her and her daughters had made one. And she had said to me that sometimes a vision board can be looked at as worldly or new age, that people focus on the wrong things. Um, and it maybe becomes their idol. And that's certainly not my intent with this. But I certainly encourage you to make a vision board. I'm going to remind, rename mine a focus board. And that's going to help me to focus on God's promises and focuses for this year. Putting together a vision board is pretty simple. I went to uh, a value village store and I purchased a frame. You can purchase a frame at many dollar stores as well. I wanted mine to be large because I have a lot of focuses that I want to concentrate on this year. There's a really awesome way of taping things down. And this is a roller tape. So you don't actually, <clears throat> excuse me, have to use glue. But this rolls on like scotch tape. And it will help you mount your um, pieces to the board. Um, I used to just use magazines and I found in those magazines different things that I cut out in different shapes to speak or say the words that I wanted to focus on. I'm going to show you my focus board and I apologize if there's any glare on it right now, um, but I wanted to show you. Mine is quite large and at the top, at the top, it shows beside still waters. And that's where I know the Lord leads me beside still waters. I'm just going to get that glare off there. Anyways, my board is quite large and I'm just going to rise it up. So on the top, I put all of the things that I want to focus on for the Lord and with the Lord. And then some personal things at the bottom. You can see in the middle here, um, the year 2021. That's there. And how... I want to live in faithfulness, in Lord's promises, in hope, in love. And I also ask God to keep our land glorious and free, that I would remember to pray for my country. But, you know, in the top section, I had that blessed, uh, uh, besides still waters, that I can trust him. I put that he will make me smile and that I will delight in him because he delights in me. I put on that. There's no limits to God. But the neatest thing I like is in the middle here, and it says the greatest blessing of all, and that is our Lord and Savior and what he did for us. And also guaranteed, and that's his promises are guaranteed forever. And uh, he will never leave us or forsake us. So I encourage you, you, can, you don't need to make a big one like this and put it in a frame, but I wanted something that I could hang on my wall and look at every day and be reminded of God's faithfulness and also some of the focus goals for myself. You know, there's always, you know, about being healthy and being fit and exercising, um, praising and praying and giving and uh, doing my part to uh, be a servant of the Lord. And, um, you know, relaxation and sleep, eating properly. Of course, I have, you know, dropped some weight there. That's always a goal of mine. And um, just being delightful in what God has for each one of us. So I encourage you and hope that you're blessed by seeing that today. So I wanted to continue on. And um, I have a couple of things as well that I found here. And one of them says, and I'm going to show this to you. And it says, on my bad days, I seek you. On my good days, I thank you. On my 
Great days I praise you, but every day I need you. Thank you, God, for always being here for me. God is so awesome. He's always here for us. And then I found this one as well, which I thought was so wonderful, and it's hope. H-O-P-E with periods in between, and it says, hold on because pain ends. Right now, you could be walking through a very painful journey. In, in this season, we all face times of pain in the journey of our life. And I encourage you to hold on because pain will end. We need to give God our weaknesses and he will give us his strength. He will give you his strength to walk in this journey that he has you on. We need to see ourselves through through the Lord's eyes and not be so overwhelmed with, you know, the, the time that we're in or the struggles that we're facing. There's a wonderful song that has encouraged me, and it's called Another in the Fire. I'm going to attach that video to the end of this talk, but I wanted to read some of the words to that song today to encourage you. Uh, it's a Hillsong United uh, version that I put on uh, for you to listen to and worship to, but it says in that song, there's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my debt left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave of my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding what power set me free? There is a grave that holds no body, and now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. There is another in the fire. I can see the light in the darkness, and the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens and the space between wears thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is. And this reckoning. And I know I will never be alone. I know, come on, I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There will be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy come every battle because I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy, count every battle, because I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy, come every battle, because I know that's where you'll be. There's another in the fire standing next to me. There's another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy, come every battle, because I know that's where you'll be. I hope that you're blessed with the words of that song. And of course, please go into worship and listen to it um, farther in the, um, the video. So I wanted to end today with something else from this book called Hope in the Dark. And it says in here, even though I'm upset, angry, confused, frustrated, disappointed, and impatient, I will remember that God is the God the Lord is the Lord is still in charge and he is good. He is righteousness. He is true. 
He is faithful. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and ever-present. The world may seem upside down, but the Lord is still there. He is sovereign. He has a plan, a much bigger plan than I can see now. I have to respect that he is God and I am not. His timing is not my timing. His ways are higher than I'll ever understand. He is supreme in all wisdom and he knows the end from the beginning. I'm just a person, his creation. He has everything under control. And I ask that the Lord will bless you today and keep you in your journey, in your struggle, in your trial. And maybe right now there is no trial in your life. Maybe you're kind of on easy street and, you know, remembering what the Lord has done in the past. But then I encourage you to pray and stand in the gap for others. I know that so has helped me through so many trials. I have a, a precious friend, Angela Fonseca, who was a partner with me in the um, the, the prayer breakfast that we uh, did together at London Gospel Temple for many years. And, you know, when I fell down because of a trial, she would help me up by praying for me. And like likewise, when she fell down in a trial, I had the privilege of standing in the gap and praying for her. And I encourage you to ask the Lord to send you a prayer partner because, you know, our relationship was definitely of the Lord and how it all came about um, was just kind of like mind boggling as well and the timing for it all. So I encourage you, if you don't have a prayer partner, to seek the Lord's face and ask if, you know, ask him to send you a prayer partner. Um, but in the meantime, you can come before the Lord. Nothing will disappoint him in what you ask or bring before him. And remember that he is God. He knows every grain of sand on this earth. He knows every strand of hair on our heads, every vein and muscle in our, in our bodies, every cell that he created, and nothing at all can shock him that we will bring before his throne and ask him. I just pray today that we will all have the obedience and faith as Mary and that we will be that trusting of God in our situations. And Lord, today I ask, Lord God, that you will spill out a great measure of faith and strength in all of those who are facing difficulty or trials right now, Lord God. I thank you for your hand of blessing upon each one of them. I thank you that you are a God who makes beauty from ashes and that you go before them. Lord, I ask that they will feel that you are even nearer than they've ever known you before. And I thank you, Lord God, for the they can cast all of their cares on you, Lord God, that you are the author and finisher of our faith and that you will bring strength and answers, Lord God, that you will bring ways and, and miracles, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord God, for all that you've done and ask this in Jesus' precious name. Today, I wanted to end with a scripture from Psalm 138, and that's going to be also out of the Passion Translation. I thank you, Lord, with all the passion of my heart. I worship you in the presence of angels. Heaven's mighty ones will hear my voice as I sing my loving praise to you. I bow down before your divine presence and bring you my deepest worship as I experience your tender love and your living truth. For the promises of your word and the fame of your name have been magnified above all else. At the very moment I called out to you, you answered me. You strengthened me deep within my soul and breathed fresh courage into me. One day all the kings of the earth will rise to you to give you thanks when they hear the living words that I have heard you speak. They too will sing of your wonderful ways, for your infallible glory is great. For though you are lofty and exalted, you stoop to embrace the lowly, yet you keep your distance from those filled with pride. By your power, mighty power, I can walk through any devastation, and you will keep me alive, reviving me. Your power set me free from the hatred of my enemies. You keep every promise you ever made to me, since your love for me is constant and endless. 
I ask you, Lord, to finish every good thing that you have begun in me. And Lord, I ask that for each one listening today, that you would finish every good thing that you have begun in them. Until we meet again next week, I ask that the Lord will bless you and keep you and that his face will shine upon you. Be blessed and take care. Bye for now.